Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're now in chapter 15. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for another opportunity to worship you in the study of your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who teaches us so that we indeed grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. May He strip away that which is foolish and ignorant, but seal to our hearts the truth that you would have each one of us know. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I can't believe that we're at chapter 15. Uh, in our last study together, we essentially finished looking at chapter 14, and so we now uh, begin chapter 15, and as I've pointed out, there are no chapter divisions in the original text. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. That's the first sentence of the first, uh, or that's the first sentence of the chapter. We are told by the Holy Spirit that we are to speak those things which become sound doctrine. In 1 Thessalonians, we're told that Jesus Christ died for us. Us. Now, that either means that, well, it means one of three things. Us could mean everyone. He died for everyone. And if He did, he, he died for us that we should not die but have everlasting life. So, so everyone has everlasting life. Or us, the word us could mean no one, which means, well, he, he didn't die for anybody, and so no one has everlasting life. Or it could mean that he died for some, and some have everlasting life, and I think it's obvious what we believe. I want to start looking at the new birth. I've done a number of videos on this. How is one born? You know, it's a simple question. I mean, obviously Nicodemus knew the answer, right? I mean, you enter your mother's womb and you're born again. Christ said that unless a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot, cannot enter the kingdom of God. So an essential requirement for entering the kingdom of God is to be born by water and spirit. Now, the water could be baptism, or it could be the Word of God. What makes sense scripturally, biblically, is Galatians 4.29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born by the Spirit. That's exactly what Christ said. 1 Peter 1, having been born again by the Word of God, not of corruptible seed, but by the Word of God. Those are, those are the very words Christ used. And so the Spirit and the Word, that's how one's born. Now, we've got a slight problem here. Modern uh, evangelism basically wrote its own book on how to be born again, and, and they, they give four to, to five, usually it's four to five, absolute necessary requirements 
if you're going to be born again, none of them biblical. You've got to repent. You have to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to believe and you need to ask forgiveness. And so well, there's four, uh, at least, to be born again. As though being born again is a process that you initiate by and you complete it. Okay, It's just not Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself said that you had to be His sheep in order to believe. You had to be born of God before you could believe. Life has to come first, and yet clearly the vast majority of preaching today is that you are born again by believing, trusting, receiving, repenting, and so on and so forth. Where when Christ Himself said, you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. The basic requirement that ought to be written to believe on Jesus Christ is you have to be a sheep. And that's a process of birth. And that, folks, is something that God did. New birth is first necessary if, if there is to be any saving faith. Dead in sin, we are just like the corpse that can't bring itself to life. The spiritually dead in sin can't make, they cannot make the slightest contribution toward their new birth. The new birth is God's work and God's work alone, and that is what we teach. That is what we ought to teach. That's what we should teach. You received it. Now, if they received it, they had to be God's child, God's sheep. They're already His. And wherein you stand. And that word stand is a perfect tense. It's finished. It's a complete transaction. They are God's sheep. Because only His sheep could receive it and stand in it. The perfect tense indicates that it's not only an action, it's a completed action, and it's done. We're looking at the result of that completed action. It's done. They're God's sheep. By which also you are saved. Fantastic. All right. But, but they're already His sheep, folks. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you had or have believed in vain. But they're His sheep. And as such, they need to be saved. So, what do we have to do, folks, to be saved? Well, clearly, we don't have to, to do anything to be born. That's up to our parents. To be born of God is God's responsibility. You had nothing, nothing, nothing to do with your new birth. But what do you have to do to be saved? Well, Modern evangelism usually lists four or five things. You know, believe, accept, repent, ask forgiveness, be baptized. That's five, at least five. However, I have found over 33 things to do to be saved. 33. How often do you hear that preached? Well, let's look at those. How are we saved? Number one, by endurance. Matthew 10, He that endures to the end shall be saved. Number two, by belief and baptism. Mark 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Number three, by faith. Luke 7, Christ said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Number four, by Christ's word. But these things I say unto you in order that you might be saved. John chapter 10. Number five, by entering the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Number six, by calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 2. Whosoever shall 
call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Number seven, by the spoken word, Acts 11. Peter, in, in referring to Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Number eight, by belief on Christ, Acts 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Number nine, by being justified, Romans chapter five. Therefore, being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath. And notice that justification came before the saved. Number 10, by being reconciled and by His life, Romans 5, much more being now reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Number 11, by hope. Romans chapter 8, we are saved by hope. Number 12, by confession and belief. Romans chapter 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We're up to number 13 here, folks. By emulation, Romans chapter 11. Provoke them to emulation, which are my flesh, in order that I might save some of them. Number 14. By the foolishness of preaching. The foolishness of preaching. 1 Corinthians 1. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And notice, they're already believing because they're His sheep. Number 15, by husband or wife. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Number 16, by being made all things to all men. 1 Corinthians 9. I am made all things to all men in order that I might by all means save some. Okay? That's a lot more than four. I'm just up to 17. Number 17. By seeking their profit. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Seeking the profit of many that in order that they may be saved. Number 18 by keeping in memory what was preached. That's, that's where we're at, right here. 1 Corinthians 15. That's exactly where we are. By which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. 19. By godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation Okay. Number 20. By grace. Ephesians 2. By grace are you saved. 21. By grace through faith. By, by grace are you saved through faith. Okay. That has to be a separate one there. So now we're up to 22. Gentiles are saved by the word spoken to them. 1 Thessalonians 2. I speak to the Gentiles in order that they might be saved. Number 23, by God's appointment. By God's appointment. 1 Thessalonians 5, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but appointed us to salvation, to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Number 24, by receiving the love of the truth. The love of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2 because they received not the love of the truth that they might be, you guessed it, saved. Number 25, by God's choice. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Number 26, by childbearing. Childbearing. 1 Timothy 2, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing. 
Number 27, by doctrine, 1 Timothy 4, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. This is what Paul wrote to Timothy. Now think of that. Timothy must have been saved, but he'd save himself by taking heed to doctrine and save others as well. Number 28, by his purpose and grace, 2 Timothy 1, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given in Christ Jesus. That's how we're saved. Number 29, by Paul's endurance. 2 Timothy 2, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Not only Paul enduring all things, the Holy Spirit enduring all things for the elect's sake. Number 30, by His mercy, not by works of righteousness, which He has done, God has done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Number 31, by His living, Christ's being alive, and His intercession, Hebrews chapter 7. Wherefore, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing that He lives to make intercession for them. Number 32, by receiving the engrafted Word. James chapter 1. Receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. And number 33, by converting a sinner, James 5, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And I have no doubt whatsoever that there are more than the 33 that I've listed here. I'm sure of, of that. But that's 33 different uses of the word save, and yet that's the popular word that we use today, or modern evangelism uses today, for being born from above. Born again, by God, from above. Has any one of you out there done all 33 of these things in order to become a Christian? Well, I, I kind of doubt it. Why just four or five? I can quote at least 33. Dearly beloved, really our big question, our, our concern ought to be, how do we become new creations in Christ? I have pointed this out in numerous videos. Redemption and salvation are two entirely different concepts in the Word of God because they're, they're two entirely different words. Moreover, brethren, I am declaring, that's a per present tense, present tense, I'm declaring the good news which I preached unto you, which you received. That's a statement of fact, okay? Folk, dearly beloved, these, these Corinthians received it. And wherein you stand, that's a, that's, a, that's a perfect tense. I'm looking at the reality of a past complete action. Nothing more to be done. They stand in it. They stand in it. Who's the they? Well, it's his sheep. Who are being saved? It's a present tense. Here are people who have received the truth, the good news that Jesus Christ, God Almighty in the flesh, died in their place. They're elect children of God, chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, born again from above by God, regenerated, quickened to life by God from above, so that, so that, they might, in this life, be saved. That is, delivered, rescued, delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from sin, self, law, the world, Satan, death. Delivered from doubt, fear, worry, and so on and so forth. 
Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Okay? Now, He either died for our sins as a select group. Everybody sins and everybody is God's and that, well, that doesn't make sense. Or nobody sins and then, well, the whole text doesn't make any sense. He died for our sins. He came into the world to save His people from their sins. Matthew, I think, 1.1. 1, 1. That's the good news. They received that. That's what the Corinthians received. And they stand in it, and that is a perfect tense. That stand's not going to change. We're looking at the present reality that you actually stand in the gospel That's as a, as a, a fabulous established fact. Okay? That's where you stand. Also, you are being saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you believed in vain. Now, are we talking about going to hell, losing our... No, we're not. These are God's people, folks. Okay, look, now listen. Let's assume for a moment, all right, that one is saved by accepting Jesus Christ as his own personal Lord and Savior. Let's just assume that that's true. Well, what that means is, what you're saying is that from the days of Adam until now, the great percentage of human beings who've ever lived on this earth have probably never heard of Jesus Christ, and so we'd have to reach the conclusion that the great percentage of them are in hell. If we believe for a moment that that's true, then we'd be driven with extreme passion to reach those who've never heard, and well, many a missionary is. If you really believe that someone in darkest Africa is going to go to hell unless you tell them about Jesus Christ, I don't see how you can not go there. Catch the next flight there. And don't pass go, don't stop, you know, to collect two hundred dollars. But then you got problems going to the mission field. If you stop to eat, somebody's gonna go to hell. If you if you come back here for a year to raise funds for your personal support, people are gonna go to hell. A whole bunch may go to hell. You might as well just go there, work there till you die. I mean, and what a terrible burden, folks, that must be. When did Jesus Christ die for our sins? On the cross. When He died for us. But God says He was crucified before the foundation of the world. In the eyes of the Almighty God, our Father, there's always been His own, there's always been His people, his children, and Christ died for them. And I've been told that believing something like that removes all the passion, it removes all the motivation, it removes all of the desire to teach biblical truth. And folks, nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm driven with the desire to tell people that they're God's child. People have come to me and they, over the years and they've said, how do you know that? You can't preach to these people and say that they're God's child. Well, if they're not God's child, they won't hear me and they won't understand. Folks, I'm not preaching to any individual. I never have. Many do. You know, when they see, you know, you see your, your brother or your sister over here off over here doing something that you don't approve of, you know, when they when they see another Christian doing something wrong, you know, you're going to preach the next Sunday on that and pastor after pastor does that. Not my job. Not my job. I'm just preaching to the room or I'm preaching into to the air, into the air. I'm preaching into cyberspace, folks. If you're God's child, He may want you to hear what I'm saying, or he, he may not. It may not be your time to hear. Paul says, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may obtain 
the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I want people to know that they're God's child and that they're rescued. They're only going to know that if they believe it. Being redeemed is one thing. Being saved is, is an entirely different subject. You have lots of Scripture. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Absolutely, I believe that. I believe that. People have said, Steve, you don't believe that. I, I believe it. I believe that. You believe a person is saved because of the finished work of Christ, Steve. So how, how can you say that? How can you say you believe that? Well, I, I believe they're God's child because of that. But they are surely not delivered, saved, rescued, unless they know that. And the way that they're going to know that, dearly beloved, is to believe it. Or believe God concerning it. But believing it doesn't make it true. You know, some of you may believe that there's a nation called France. Okay? But the fact you believe that or don't believe it has nothing to do with the, the, the truth. Okay? There is such a nation called France. Truth is not established by belief. If we believe the truth that we are God's child, what a difference that makes in our lives. You know, I've often used the illustration, if your uncle died and left you a billion dollars and you didn't know it, well, that doesn't mean that you don't have a billion dollars. You do have a billion dollars. The trouble is, you don't know it. So you can't, you can't benefit from it. You can't use it. But it's yours. He left it to you. It's yours. Why not endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the deliverance, the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory? Not that they'll go to heaven. They're, 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 gonna, they're already going to go to heaven because of what Christ did. They're going to heaven because they're God's sheep. And folks, I wouldn't trade anything, Not I wouldn't trade billions of dollars or any possession that you can name, that you could possibly name, for the knowledge that Jesus Christ died in my place and I am God's child. Nothing, nothing could ever equal that. No passion to go to the mission field to, to save someone from hell can equal the passion of telling God's precious children what wonderful things that He's done for them in Christ. You know, I'm often criticized for that. What God did in the person of the incarnate Christ is die in the place of His children, made sin for them so that they wouldn't die. They can't die. They were not appointed to death, but to deliverance. And the good news, the good news, is He died in our place. I've declared it unto you. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. I'm so glad that God put those words in there. God's plan, according to God's plan. God decreed that Jesus Christ was going to die in my place before He ever created the heavens and the earth. I, I, don't, I don't know how to put into words how wonderful that truth is. That Jesus Christ died in my place. A substitutionary death. He died for me. I'm personally persuaded that there will be huge numbers of people in heaven who never knew that Jesus Christ died for them until they stand in glory. But God knows His own. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Never perish. And I couldn't begin to count the number of times that I've been told 
that Christians can lose their salvation if they're not careful. I've got good news for you folks. You haven't been appointed to wrath. Jesus Christ died in your place. You are His child. Wonderful to know that. Wonderful to know that your sins aren't forgiven because you asked them to be, because you repented and you asked Him to forgive, to forgive them. Folks, they're forgiven because they were placed on Christ when He died. Christ was made sin for us. Who are the us? Who are the us? I think there's a myriad of Christians who believe that, well, that might be true of me. And it might not be. The context, dearly beloved, is the Gospel. You won't find anything in that good news at all that consists of you doing anything. Look at the text. It's not asking you to do anything. It's declaring the good news of Jesus Christ and what He did. There's nothing like that there at all. The Gospel that we preach is the good news concerning what Christ did for us, not what we must do for God. And once you understand that dead men, spiritually dead men, cannot hear or believe, which is what the Word clearly says, but they have to be quickened to life First, only then will you, well, will what you're reading here make any sense. You know, some of my best friends are, are firm Arminians. I was raised in an Arminian church, and, and there was never any certainty at all there about sonship. But it's not true of us who know and love the Lord. We know that our Father is God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. That's my God. He said He'd never leave me. He said He'd never forsake me. It doesn't matter what suffering comes because He told me that He has given me not only the privilege of believing on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And I'd like for you to think about what that really means. That's salvation. That's deliverance. If you keep in memory, don't forget. Paul's, the Holy Spirit says, don't forget. Okay, Keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Huge number of your Christian friends take the end of verse 2 saying, well, see, you could lose all, you could lose it all. You could lose all this. The perfect tense of stand is no longer a perfect tense, I guess. Folks, it doesn't say that. All it says is the thing that you could lose is the saved, not the other stuff. And the saved is a present tense. What does it mean that you are being saved? Well, you know, theologians, they, they, they wrestled with that and they basically concluded that, well, you, you were saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved, and, well, that tends to settle the problem. The simple answer, folks, is that you are rescued, you are delivered, you are saved as you trust Him. Dearly beloved, when you quit trusting, there's no deliverance in your life. You're mad at God. You're, you're worried about everything. You're worried about things. You're, you're scared to death about, you know, whatever. I don't know. And that deliverance is gone. But as long as you trust Him, as long as you believe Him, you're saved, delivered, rescued, that's what the word saved means. What a wonderful thing to trust in the living God. Isn't that what He desires of us the most? I've, I've mentioned that before. I believe that with all of my heart. You couldn't do anything better in your life right now than trust Him. It's what He desires the most of us. Is that we trust Him in all areas of our lives. That, folks 
leads to salvation. Whereas redemption is solely a work of the sovereign God. And this we're going to pick up here, verse 4, next time when I come back. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.